Hello and welcome to India Speak, the podcast by the Center for Policy Research. I am Sushant Singh, Senior Fellow at CPR. This is the second episode of our series featuring leading experts and academics on the many facets of Sino-India relations. Some of them will be looking at the historical side of things, while others will focus on these strategic facets. Today, we will be discussing the military aspects, looking at China's People's Liberation Army and what it means for India. And to do that, our guest today is Janice Blasco, an independent analyst and former senior military fellow at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. A retired Lieutenant Colonel of the U.S. Army with 23 years of service as a military intelligence officer and foreign area officer specializing in China, he served at the Defense Intelligence Agency and Office of Special Operations. From 1992 to 1996, he was an army attache in Beijing and Hong Kong. Dennis has written numerous articles and book chapters on the Chinese military, including his book, The Chinese Army Today, Tradition and Transformation for the 21st Century, which remains an essential reading even after more than 15 years. Dennis, welcome to India Speak. Thank you very much for the invitation. Let me begin with your book, Dennis, where you explained who forms the PLA, what it is, what it is not, where exactly is the People's Liberation Army, how it will fight, what its doctrine is, what equipment it uses, how it trains, and how it interacts with the larger society. Essentially, you know, your book argues that PLA is an army of the revolution, it owes its loyalty to the party, and political guidance plays an important part in the professional character of the, of the Chinese military. What, what is the best way to your mind to explain the uniqueness of the PLA and the differences that it has vis-a-vis -vis militaries from other democratic states like the United States, the United Kingdom, France, or even India for that matter? Well, thank you. The uh, PLA definitely is a political army. Uh, however, I would say for the past uh, 30, 40 years, it's been less and less of a revolutionary army and becoming much more professional as it has modernized since its last war, last major conflict in 1979. But the main point that it is an arm of the party, of the Chinese Communist Party, remains, and they have a huge infrastructure in personnel to maintain that party control. Uh, but at the same time, over the past four decades of modernization, it has been becoming a much more professional military uh, and a much more modernized military with uh, the equipment and, and doctrine. So would it be fair to say that the PLA is an untested army, having last fought a war against Vietnam in 1979, four decades ago? And I ask this, Dennis, because this is a point uh, raised by many people to point to a weakness of the PLA, especially after the recent theatrization under President Xi uh, seven, eight years ago, that, the, that, the, that this PLA, this military is just not tested at all. Right. It hasn't been tested in actual combat uh, since the 1979 war and also, but also too, and this I think is important for the understanding of the situation in Eastern Ladakh. Uh, in Aksai Chin, is that uh, for most of the 80s, there was a low-level uh, border conflict simmering on the Sino-Vietnamese border, uh, where they rotated troops in and out for many years from all over the country uh, to get some experience getting shot at. And in some ways, I, I see a lot of what is going on now uh, in Aksai Chin and also South China Sea, the East China Sea, as similar to that, but without as much gunfire and actual conflict. But the, the whole point of uh, these deployments and these activities is to pursue national objectives as uh, given to the PLA from the Chinese Communist Party and, and the government. So while it hasn't actually uh, been in a major uh, conflict, it is trying its best uh, through these deployments, plus 
uh, training, uh, which it has really improved over the past uh, couple of decades. It's, uh, it, it continues constantly to in, improve training and uh, the, the type of training that it undertakes. Uh, so it, it, it's not tested in actual conflict, but I think uh, some of the things that we often say might be a problem, such as the relationship of the commander the, to the political uh, commissars or political instructors, I think they might have worked that out since it has, they've uh, had that uh, situation in place for decades. And so I think they look at that political relationship uh, with the army to the party and with the uh, commanders, with the political system. I think they look at that as a strength. Dennis, uh, the question which I actually wanted to, uh, what I was trying to ask you is, uh, with this theatrization model and this restructuring that has taken place, uh, can uh, training or various exercises replicate uh, something which you're going to face in real combat? Because theatrization is a very, very different kind of uh, structure of the, of, the, of the PLA. Yeah, actually, again, I think this is something that we can see in the Oxide Chin is that their actual deployments look a lot different than their training. Uh, down on the, the border and near the line of actual control, uh, they're deployed much differently than we see them, at least uh, on television and photographs. In the Oxai Chin, they look like they're really taking this seriously, digging in, uh, spacing themselves out. Uh, they're deployed over a much wider area than they would be normally. I think they've learned some lessons about uh, what happens if uh, somebody starts shooting at you. And so uh, it's quite different. The, the training that they do, uh, even the force on force, the red versus blue with the uh, laser, laser identifiers that pop up smoke when people get hit, we, we do the same thing at our national training center. Uh, and it looks very similar. Uh, but a lot of what I see away from the border, uh, that training looks quite different than the way I see them on deployed on the ground in that very, very difficult terrain in the Himalayas. Yeah, before I get to excite Chin, uh, I just wanted to go, go back to, the, uh, to something which you said about the strengths and weaknesses of the PLA. You, know, you spoke about the training, you spoke about the, uh, the deployment, the logistics. You know, how would you compare the PLA, the modern PLA of the 21st century or of 2022 uh, with the U.S. military or with the Indian Armed Forces? You know, and uh, I hear a lot from my former colleagues in the Indian military about the quality of Chinese infrastructure, the pace of such infrastructure construction. They say the way, the pace at which they construct uh, roads, tracks, bridges, you know, uh, habitat is something to be, is something to be seen the induction of modern equipment into the PLA, their mobilization times, the pace of their mobilization, their logistic support. Uh, while they are not so sure about the quality of the PLA soldiers who are roughing it out in the winters, uh, they are also not sure about their relationship with the political commissars or the military commanders. How would you characterize the strengths and weaknesses of the PLA as they exist today? Well, one of the things that I try to uh, emphasize is not to mirror image. I know, I hope I know, I may not know as the, the United States military as well as I did when I retired a long time ago, uh, but it's a mistake to look at what the PLA is doing and say, well, we do something like that, therefore they must be just as good as us and um, can... Uh, operate on the battlefield in the same way that we would, or would even want to operate in the same way we would. The PLA is actually uh, constructed much different uh, than the United States military, even though reforms have come up with some aspects that are sort of like the United States. But the more I look at the PLA and the entire Chinese armed forces, the more differences I see. Uh, 
And perhaps one of the biggest differences, obviously, is the funding. The um, PLA budget, no matter how you calculate it, is a fraction, maybe a third of the United States uh, defense budget now. Uh, yet the PLA, the People's Armed Police, and the militia are many, many times larger than the, um, the United States military. One of the things that they are constantly talking about is um, trying to conserve money and spend their money wisely. And this leads to another element that is uh, consistent even today when, when it reform started years ago in that PLA modernization is subordinate to, but coordinated with economic development. One of the things they learned from the Soviet Union, the demise of the Soviet Union in the late 80s and 90s, was that the Soviets spent themselves to death and they didn't have an economy that could support uh, their population. The Chinese have learned from that and uh, defense spending, as much as it is in the in China, is still uh, does does not interfere with uh, the civilian economy. They also look to the civilian economy to support uh, PLA modernization, and we can see that happening everywhere. Uh, so, despite everything that's been going on, they're still trying to do it relatively on a shoestring budget. Dennis, if uh, you're comparing it with the U.S. military, and that's why you're talking about a shoestring budget, but when you compare it to a country like India, uh, which is economically much weaker, the, the, the PLA man-to-man -man spends far greater than India spends. So in that, in that sense, India would be in even bigger trouble. Yes, and like I say, I, uh, I haven't studied the Indian military, and so I'm not as familiar with it. But um, yes, I, I, from your perspective, it's much different, yes. Yes. So because from our perspective, it is that the, that the, that the Chinese uh, economy is five times the Indian economy, their defense budget is four or five times our defense budget. They know that they're spending man to man, they're spending far more than we are spending. They're producing much more military equipment, military platforms within that country, while we are not producing that much equipment within our country. Uh, most of we are one of the biggest importers of defense platforms uh, globally. So it really, uh, it, uh, the, the advantage that the United States military has over the PLA, perhaps the PLA has over the Indian military to some extent. Yes, and perhaps that's a good reason why or it's, uh, we should all be happy that the Himalayas are between us. Or between the two countries, because it, it it's such a such a difficult such difficult terrain. Oh yes, definite. Yeah, uh, definite. But one of the things too, one of and just uh, I'm not quite sure what the Indian reserves are like. If you've got a system of Indi of uh, reserve units. Yeah, we have a system of reserve units, Dennis, but it is not really, we don't need to use the reserves. Uh, reserves are not called into service. I don't remember in the last many decades reserves being called into service at any point in time. Right. But for example, here in the United States, and especially over the past uh, two wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, we used our reserves almost interchangeably with our active duty forces. Uh, the PLA reserves are much less uh, advanced uh, and really would not contribute in the same way that United States reserves. They, they sound like uh, the PLA reserves might be a little bit more advanced in development than the Indian, but they're quite different from the United States. Then is getting back to what everybody uh, is talking about, the Sino-India border crisis in Aksai Chin or Ladakh uh, in the high Himalayas. You know, you, based on your extensive reading of Chinese military media and studying publicly available satellite imagery, you know, do you now have some understanding of what happened on the disputed border starting in the summer of 2020? And more importantly, why did it happen? What happened? Firstly, what happened? And secondly, why did it happen? The why is much more difficult, uh, but first it's uh, important to start with the PLA Army 
is broken down into two, for this purposes, let's say uh, two major elements. One are, is the border defense forces, uh, which are deployed all along all of China's borders, bo border and coastal defense forces. And I estimate there's at least 100,000, maybe up to 200,000 border defense troops whose main job is to monitor the border, to uh, do some initial um, reporting and fighting, delay any invasion that comes on. But then the, the bulk of the uh, PLA army is in the uh, mobile operational forces, the divisions and the brigades, the group armies that are stationed further back from the border. And in the Aksai Chin, I see uh, two permanently deployed border defense regiments through that area. One in the one regiment in the Hotan prefecture in the military subdistrict, and another uh, regiment in the uh, Nagari or Ali uh, military subdistrict prefecture of Tibet. And one of the interesting things, again, this is a it's an anomaly, but uh, that Nagari sector of Tibet is actually under the command of the Nanjiang, Southern Xinjiang military district. And it, there's a big dip uh, into Tibet. It's a big bite chunk that's cut out that is under command of the uh, Xinjiang military, military district and Nanjiang military district. Uh, I believe that what uh, initially happened is that uh, the border defense forces, and especially up in the Galwan Valley, uh, were the, it was border defense forces that uh, had the June 15th conflict. Uh, and it was specifically one, one regiment, and I think one battalion out of that regiment that was patrolling in the Galwan Valley Honestly, I credit both sides for the discipline that they showed uh, because both sides were carrying weapons and they got into a major scuffle, a major fight, but no, no shots were fired, which I think says something about the discipline on both sides. But these, uh, and, and again, at the time, there was talk about there was a changeover between units. It could have been changeover between battalions and whatever within that regiment. But for some reason, uh, I, I don't believe, uh, and based on no evidence, but I don't believe that there was an order from Beijing or Xinjiang or Nanjiang to go out and kill people. I believe it was units, a lot of people in very close proximity that started pushing and shoving each other that got out of hand. And, but eventually, uh, both sides were disciplined enough to pull back and withdraw. At the same time, or just before that happened, there had been exercises in the area, but not in the Galwan Valley that I'm a not in the valley. That's a terrible place to do military exercises. But to the north, up in the Depsong Plains and beyond, and perhaps to the southeast in Nagari, there were out-of-area units coming in and doing exercises. But at the, at the same time, there were some of these out-of-area uh, units, and I believe they were the initial forces came from Xinjiang, Nanjiang, uh, the uh, sixth, what is now combined arms division started moving forces into the sector south of Galwan. Eventually, they went into Galwan, but they started going into Gunka, the hot spring region, then. Um, the north of Pangung Lake, 
I'm not sure when they went south of Pangung Lake, but they eventually showed up south of Pangung Lake. Anyway, they started moving in these divisional elements from Xinjiang, and over the next six months uh, poured in what I would consider uh, probably an entire division, some 10,000 people uh, spread about, spread through these uh, four or five sectors from Gawan to Hot Springs to Pangung Lake to Spangur Lake uh, and s uh, set up these encampments which uh, the, the most important thing is, and one of the things that's very useful for our identification, is that the encampments are generally uh, far apart. The sectors often are 35 miles apart. So they, you, you can't move troops back and forth between the sectors, but they've come in with artillery and artillery can often support each other from the sectors. And it's often by seeing the artillery that I can uh, make estimates of what size units are there. But uh, I, I, after looking through the uh, available Google Earth from October to January and early February of last year, uh, I estimated that a full division had been deployed there. Uh, but it was deployed to stay. It wasn't deployed to go south or east or, 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 or west. Uh, it was deployed to uh, hold territory and, uh, as they say, create facts on the ground. The important thing is that they were dug in by engineers and uh, probably uh reinforced by engineers to do the digging in and perhaps some civilian engineers came in to to dig out these uh camps that are all revetted have berms uh they're in 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 defensive positions spread out for miles and miles in in the Gawan valley uh the there is a regiment i estimate but it's 23 miles from the line of actual control on Pangung Lake, they've got uh, perhaps two regiments, a, co a combined arms regiment supported by an art, uh, firepower or artillery regiment, but it's spread for almost 15 miles along uh, the Pangung Lake. So uh, those are defensive positions meant to hold territory. You know, Dennis, a couple of questions. One is, you said uh, this is a defensive formation. You spoke about the border defense forces. Uh, so what is the significance of the border defense pro forces? Are they as well trained as the regular operational troops? Are they poorly trained, poorly equipped, less equipped? Are they paramilitary, gendarmerie? What are they? Yeah. And the second question, Dennis, is uh, were there any offensive formations there which could have gone and taken, taken some territory on the Indian side if the need arose? The... Um... Border defense forces are generally much lighter than the mobile operational units. They're mostly infantry. Uh, they may have some uh, heavy machine guns. They might have some mortars. A few regiments have older armored personnel carriers. There might be, in, in some places, coastal defense will have artillery, but generally they're spread out in company. Uh, size positions miles and miles apart. Their mission is to patrol the border and man outposts and observe things. Uh, and so they would be observing what the Indian side is doing, and they might be reacting to that. And as you know, you have over the past decades established protocols for how to pat patrol, where to patrol, how to identify yourselves, how to carry your weapons and things like that. But these people, the border defense uh, unit, uh, I would estimate probably uh, throughout that entire region, the two prefectures probably are two regiments amounting to some 4,000, 4,500 troops. And that would include the uh, 
patrol boats on the Pangong Lake. Uh, so you've got about 4,500 of those troops spread out over the border of uh, 250 miles or four, you know, uh, very long border. And then superimposed upon that are these outside units from uh, Nanjiang, the division. So what has happened is in many places, the um, out of area units came in and reinforced and built camps around existing uh, border defense units. Now, could uh, any of those uh, forces cross the LAC and, and had a, a attempted an offensive uh, to take land well into what is established Indian territory? Yes, certainly they could have tried, but as you know, this is a this is terrible uh, terrain for mechanized movement. It would be very difficult to to make those kinds of movements uh, if there were any sort of opposition with modern artillery or anti tank weapons or air support. Uh, any sort of uh, thrust into the other side's territory would be very vulnerable. Uh, De Dennis, if I may, uh, if I may, if I may uh, intervene here, uh, based on your study of the Chinese military media, uh, do you uh, could you ascertain what were the reasons for the PLA doing what it did? Uh, have you been able to see any analysis of that? Any reasoning given out anywhere? Uh, I have not seen exactly why they have done that. And that would be a party, a much higher level uh, decision. You're familiar, I, I take it you're familiar with the concept of chicken and egg, which came first, the chicken and egg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the Indian side says the Chinese have been building infrastructure along the border. The Chinese side says the Indians have been building infrastructure along the border. So who's who did it first? Both sides are improving that infrastructure. And we're seeing that now with this bridge that uh, is being built across the Pangong Lake. Uh, Dennis, uh, uh, based on your uh, assessment, so what are the number of PLA troops, uh, including the border guarding forces and the combined arms division? Uh, what is the approximate number of troops you would assess as based on the uh, encampments, etc., uh, that the P PLA has deployed in Aksai Chen? Yes, I look back to maybe 20 miles, 25 miles from the LAC back into Chinese territory, and I see five sectors that I've mentioned before. I don't see the very northern sector of Depsong, and I don't see the very southern sector of uh, Dep Demchok. Demchok. Yeah. Demchok. Yeah. But the five sectors that I see, uh, which is about you know, 200 miles and then 20 miles, 25 miles back, uh, when you include border defense, the division, the division, which I would estimate to be about 10,000 personnel. And then there are certainly uh, non-divisional forces, engineers come in. Come in. Uh, I have seen uh, further back in uh, Rutong, uh, what I think is a long range multiple rocket launcher battalion so I think there's artillery, there's probably, uh, there could be some special operations forces. There could be, there's definitely some communications forces. There's a lot of <clears throat> transportation uh, support forces, uh, both from the region and then from the army and from the joint logistics support force. So I would say that there's probably about 20,000 total when you include the border defense, the division, the combined arms division, and the uh, supporting forces, somewhere in the 20,000 range. Uh, but Dennis, uh, based on the military formations, areas, districts, which are involved on the, uh, on the PLA side of the crisis, uh, do we have any knowledge on the commanders and their personalities who are involved? Uh, 
uh, and has the recent restructuring made a difference to way uh, to the way these things operate in uh, now and and on the uh, and also how these commanders now operate at the uh, operational level you know the regimental commanders the division commanders we may know the names but i don't know that we know much about them uh, the major general who's in charge of the nanjiang military district is the one who meets with your co-commander co-commander yes, <clears throat> commander and so <clears throat> i would imagine you know him fairly well um and i i don't follow personalities that closely but i believe that if if i remember correctly he's been there for quite he's got a lot of experience in in xinjiang uh there's been a lot of talk about the uh Western theater, change of commands, having four commanders in a couple years and all that kind of stuff. The first change of command, a new guy came in without much experience in the region. Um, and he replaced somebody who had been in the region for, for a long time. Then he, and I think uh, medical problems led to him leaving, which brought in a third person who also didn't stay but a couple months and now finally a fourth commander has come in who also has extensive experience so uh, one of the problems with pla changes of commands you never really know if the medical reasons are the real medical reasons for their departure which they could be there could be other reasons too right now i believe that they do have in all in the chain of command uh, people with extensive experience operating in Xinjiang because it is an anomaly. It's much different. It's uh, Xinjiang's um, forces did not undergo the same kind of reforms that the the rest, the vast majority of the rest of the PLA undertook. Uh, in Xinjiang, there are no group armies. The rest of the PLA is pretty much group armies, except for Tibet military district. And so the there has been change and modernization in Xinjiang, but they still have both the same border defense chain of command and uh, chain of command for the divisions and other supporting units as they did before reform. And I believe they have done that because of the unique situation, the huge expanses of land and the harsh terrain throughout that area. Dennis, uh, just stepping back a bit, uh, uh, what is the political direction to the PLA now, particularly on Taiwan and on South China Sea? And I ask this because there is definitely a connection between what the PLA does on Taiwan, what the political direction in Taiwan is, to, to on Taiwan is, to what uh, PLA does vis-a-vis -vis India. Because uh, uh, you know, if if nothing happens on Taiwan, then doing something on India uh, allows the, the the Communist Party to showcase itself as uh, doing something to for the PLA to also showcase itself. So, do we know something about the political direction that the PLA has now on Taiwan and on South China Sea? Well, I would say that what we're seeing in Aksai Chin is the army equivalent of what we're seeing in the South China Sea and opposite Taiwan. In the South China Sea, we're seeing primarily a naval operation, a single service naval operation uh, with the building of uh, structures on the reefs and all that. And then against Taiwan, we're seeing a more combined or more joint operation where we're seeing both naval and air force, but a, a, a heavy air force presence with all the flights South, mostly south of the island. Uh, but both of these, or all three of these different sectors, or fronts, as you might want to call them, are being undertaken, I'm, I'm certain, at the uh, direction of the Central Military Commission and the Chinese Communist Party. 
the PLA in that regard is obeying the orders of the of the party to, in their mind, with Taiwan, uh, it is to prevent further steps toward independence by Taiwan. In other words, deter d- d- deterrence of uh, Taiwan independence. And in the South China Sea, in, in many ways, it's uh, similar to what's going on in Aksai Chin. It's establishing <clears throat> realities on the, on the surface um, and, and establishing military patrols in that region to uh, reinforce their uh, claims to the disputed areas. I, I don't see any of them uh, building up in offensive uh, deployments that would be necessary for a real war. For example, if you were to look what's going on opposite Ukraine, you see concentrations of forces which are much different than what you see uh, the PLA doing. Uh, Dennis, one final question, and let me put you on the spot. Are there any signs of China and India going to war based on whatever you see, whatever you you hear, whatever you analyze? Or are we going to see something on the India border, what, as you just said earlier, uh, what we saw from China on the Vietnam border, but with lesser kinetics, maybe, you know, lesser artillery shelling, uh, lesser casualties, what we saw between 1979 and 1987 uh, on the Vietnam border. What is, what is your, my final question to you, but do you see war or no? Or no, no I, I don't see a decision to go to war. The problem is, the uh, the more we all sides increase the tension, they hype their their soldiers up, uh, and and then send them out to do small unit patrols. I see the potential for escalation of something like happened in June of 2020, where perhaps a platoon a company, a battalion size element clashes with the other side. There may not be immediate command and control with higher headquarters and things could spiral out of, uh, out of control. That's what worries me in all of these places that a miscalculation, a mistake, uh, a misidentification could uh, cause something to uh, grow into something much bigger. But what if, if that does not happen, what I do see is the PLA digging in to stay in these um, encampments in the, the sectors that I've described. They look like they're there. To, to stay for quite some time. Now, it's not infrastructure. It's not as expensive doing all of that as it is building facilities. So if, and the good thing that I see between the Indian and Chinese side is at least you're having meetings. They may not amount to much, but at least you're talking. Talking is better than not talking. And it, it, it's possible the generals who meet aren't going to make these decisions. But if they're told by Delhi or Beijing to come to some sort of agreement, they, there could be uh, a political uh, way out of this. Um, with, and, and in all of these, both sides are going to have to make some concessions. In, in some ways, I do see the Chinese, if there is no political uh, resolution through negotiations, they're prepared to stay for a long time and rotate units in. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I've only seen units coming in from uh, Xinjiang. But if they stay there for years on end, they may bring in units from other places. If it, if it goes on that long. And this, this to me, is a very important test 
not so much tactically about how they can fight, but how, how they can actually live in such austere conditions and support them uh, such large deployments of uh, forces for extended periods of time. This is a very difficult logistics operation to keep that many people in the field um, healthy and prepared to fight if necessary. Dennis, that's something we look forward to how the PLA how the PLA behaves, and I uh, and I'm happy to end on a very hopeful note that things would probably look up and there would be a political solution to this crisis between uh, two of Asia's biggest countries, the two of Asia's biggest uh, biggest biggest past. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dennis, for coming on to the podcast. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you uh, for listening. Uh, for more information on our work. Follow us on Twitter at CPR underscore India and log on to our website at www.cprindia.org.